We are in our sermon series, Follow Me, Advancing One to One. We are returning after a short week, detour week, in the book of John that we use to complement that which was so beautifully presented before us last Sunday with the Peronio family, showing us what they do on a given day, sharing the good news of Jesus Christ by drama and sketch pad. They did a marvelous job, and I felt while still staying in our sermon series, Follow Me, that it would be great to jump to the greatest disciple maker ever, the Lord Jesus himself, and inviting his 12 to remain with him and to focus on the gospel of Jesus Christ with those that we lead. We are returning for the remaining few weeks of the series. It's been an extended one, but a good one, I pray, through the book of Colossians. If you've got your Bibles, I invite you to turn to Colossians chapter 3 this morning and hold your finger there or or hold your place. We'll join that passage in just a moment. The Apostle Paul is believed to have written 13 of the 27 what we call books or letters. He is 13 of them are attributed to Paul alone, by far the most in number and nearly the most in quantity of material. One man writing nearly half of our New Testament. Unique to Paul, no other writer uses this expression as he does, not even just less frequent, but almost never do you find another New Testament writer, John, or Peter, or Luke. No other writer of the New Testament uses the expression, as Paul does, put on. It is unique to him. It is consistent through a number of his letters, this idea of put on. I have a handful of verses, a handful of passages for you to give you an indication of this commitment that he has made to this concept of putting on. The first one I share with you is out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he is talking about the resurrection that Jesus Christ has brought about, he says this, for this perishable must put on the imperishable, and this mortal must put on immortality talking about our resurrection, that our mortal bodies, what we now exist in, cannot inherit eternal life, but God has made a way that we might inherit eternal life, and that with, a, with an imperishable and immortal body. And he calls us to put it on. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 3, the same apostle Paul says this, For indeed, in this house we groan, longing to be clothed with our dwelling from heaven, inasmuch as we, having put it on, will not be found naked. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, we read this from Paul, And put on the new self, which is the likeness of God, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Also in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11, the very famous armor of God passage. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. And maybe outside of Colossians for today, my favorite of all of these references, Romans chapter 13, he says this, Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. Put on, put on, put on. We find ourselves in a similar place yet again with that same apostle now in the passage that we look at today, Colossians chapter 3, verses 12 to 17. Would you stand with me? Yes, one more time, or maybe not. 
I may do it five more times. We'll see. Verses 12 to 17 of this passage. I'll be reading from the New American Standard Bible. Whatever version you are using, you can follow along. Verse 12 of chapter 3. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. May God add his blessing to the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. You may be seated. As I've already shared with you in Colossians chapter 1, in in weeks past, Colossians chapter 1, verse 28, is the key verse of the entire book. We proclaim him, admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom, so that we may present every man complete in Christ. It is the reason why Paul is doing what he's doing among this church, among the people of this church, the disciples that are found there, disciples of Epaphras, the founder of the church, and Paul now himself, by extension, that I want to present you complete in Christ. The passage that we looked at today, that we just read and will continue to look at for the remainder of the morning, verses 12 to 17 are a powerful, powerful message among the believers, the disciples and disciple-makers of Jesus Christ. You cannot make disciples without bumping into each other, and when you bump into each other, conflict happens. But God meant for that. He ordained such conflict that like iron sharpening iron, we might be made complete. This passage, chapter 3, verses 12 to 17, is one of a handful of go-to passages that I have both the labor and the privilege of bringing typically two people, or maybe more, maybe two or more people, together who are in conflict. I'm sure you, it is no surprise to you that one of the, the roles that I might carry as a pastor of a church is to mediate and to help navigate conflict between brothers and sisters, brothers and sisters in Christ. That may take the form of a lot of human relationships. I can tell you probably the most common, and it it is also, I'm sure, very little surprise to you, is the conflict that comes between the most intimate of all human relationships, husbands and wives. It is not exclusive to that, but it is one very profound example. It could be parent and child. It could be friend. It could be literal, familial brother and sister. Or it could be, and I'm speaking in general, of course, of brothers and sisters in Christ. Conflict. Disciple making. Follow me. Creating a culture of leading and following is without a doubt filled with friction, tension, missed expectations, and conflict. When I counsel with people, and I'll use more than anything else, the the human, the the God-ordained but human institution of marriage, this is where I often go. You see in verses 13 that we would bear with one another, forgive each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you, beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. 
You can imagine, if, it, if only by imagination, or maybe even in cases by personal experience, sitting with a couple or some friends or whatever the circumstance is, sitting among people who are in great distress in their relationship and asking them, are you prepared to do what the Word of God says? Are you prepared to take the risk of taking God at His Word? Before we can enter in to the challenge that is Colossians 3, 12 to 17, or the remainder of it, the, the bulk of it, we must start where Paul starts. The title of today's message is A New Wardrobe. And it begins in verse 12. The first point is this that I am reminded or I remember who I am. It is a critical first step. Verse 12 says, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. Just stop there for a moment. So, therefore, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved. This is an identity in which that we live into that we do not gain of our own effort. As saints, as believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we immediately receive these kinds of labels, these, this identity, that we were chosen of God, holy and beloved. When I sit across from a husband and wife who are in great distress for one reason or another, one of the challenges for each of them, for themselves, but especially maybe more so projected on the other one that they're looking at. And oftentimes I would bring them to this first and foremost. It's where Paul begins and he says, you are chosen of God, holy and beloved. Do you see this other person that way? Do you know them as this? See, we look at this and think, that he is talking sort of exclusively that the mirror is on us. But the challenge for, a, for a one who is abiding in Christ, or for one who has dedicated his or her life to Christ, it is allowing us to see another in this way. That you are chosen, holy, and beloved. When conflict happens in a relationship, in a human relationship, Identity goes out the window. It is surrendered. It's sacrificed on the altar of payment. It's sacrificed on the altar of what is due me or you. What kind of, what do I owe to this debt? Paul starts it with, for you are chosen of God, holy and beloved. A few times for this morning I'm going to allow us to be referred back to the study material that I've encouraged each of you to the extent that you are able to do it to join us in the gospel-centered life study series that we as a church are going through. Maybe that's happening individually, maybe that's happening in the context of a larger community of people, a home group for instance. Or if you're doing it on your own, we've tried to provide discussion opportunities so that you don't feel alone as you walk through this very powerful material pointing us to the gospel. In chapter 3 of that study book, makes the distinction of what it means to understand our identity and the difference between, being, between viewing ourselves or another believer among us, viewing us as orphans or sons and daughters. And on one of those pages, page 33, there is a long list of what an orphan believes and a long list of a of a uh, contrasting uh, list of what a son or daughter might believe. And I've just pulled a few out for you to see this morning. There's many more that I could have used, but just to give us an example of the difference between being an orphan and being a son or daughter. An orphan lives on a success-fail basis. That is absolutely true. I've watched it. An orphan lives on a success-fail basis. Everything that he or she does is so that it might gain what he, he or she doesn't have, the love and the belonging. 
of a family. And so that little one or even that adult, if he or she is orphaned, having no sense of belonging, they are motivated to succeed, they are on a pass-fail standard. But what about a son or a daughter? A son or daughter knows and feels forgiven and totally accepted. It's a, very, it's a stark contrast between the two. An orphan needs to be right, much the same as the previous comment, lives on a success-fail basis. He or she needs to be right. Why? Because every bit of his or her performance will yield the love that they desire, or at least that's what they believe. And every time I am wrong... On every occasion, as an orphan, that I am wrong, what does that mean? It's a mark against me. And if I get too many marks, I am forever unlovable. So I must be right every time. What does a son or daughter feel or know or is able to do in this case to examine our deeper motives? You see, when a father says to me, Gordon, you are accepted You are forgiven and accepted. Here's an area, however, in your life where you have not fully surrendered over to me. Let's find out why. Why is that? But at no point in that examination is there ever a possibility that the motive would fall so deeply into the darkness that I am no longer a son or daughter. It never even enters into that realm. Gordon, I probe your heart for your good. You are my son, and there is no risk of that changing. Let's do business with this issue. And you are free to examine. You are free to feel the failure that exists that all of us know well, but never to the point of being no longer being accepted. And a third one, an orphan has a critical spirit, complaining and bitter. Would any of us blame them? What a tragedy to exist with no connection to anyone, no belonging whatsoever. It is the epitome of complaining and bitter. What does a son or daughter recognize? That he or she can trust less in himself or herself, and more in the Holy Spirit. The gospel-centered life, says the Lord Jesus, has paid the debt of my sin. And because of that, I am an adopted son. Romans and Galatians, he tells us that you call out, Abba, Father, Daddy. No orphan can say that. They long to say that, but they know that they don't have that connection. A son or daughter knows that they have that connection. They don't complain. They know that their life, every bit of their life has been mapped out by their heavenly Father. And even the hardship that comes into their life, though difficult, they can be led by the Holy Spirit now to endure and to overcome. These are just some examples of the difference between an orphan and a son or daughter. It's about knowing who we are. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, these are are titles and labels and character qualities that have been given, not earned. A mentor of mine from years past, a truly meaningful friend, former professor at Dallas Seminary, I've quoted him in other places here up on, I mean, here and other times. Dr. Tom Constable, in his commentary on Colossians, he gets a little personal for a moment in his commentary, and he describes this scenario. In doing prison evangelism, I have learned that many prisoners grew up hearing from their parent or parents that they would never amount to anything and would probably end up in prison. How ironic thinking of themselves as losers, they became what they thought they were. God has specially selected believers 
and has set them apart for great things and has made them objects of his love. In view of these privileges, the following characteristics are only reasonable. I know that we do not promote, and I highly discourage, a pure promotion of self-esteem. But what I am for is making sure my children and my friends and those, my disciples, if you will, understand who they are in Christ. Chosen, holy, and beloved. It, it, it sets the course for our lives. From there, we move from being reminded of what our identity is to then wearing his clothes. We know the story, the little orphan Annie, right? An orphan. An orphan with tattered clothes and a bit wild and not too liked by her, by her surrogate mother until the wealthy man comes to rescue her and makes her, moves her from the status of orphan to a daughter and brings her into his home and gives her her new wardrobe, her new clothes. What she brought with her is now worthless. It was tattered all along, and when she brings it there, it is not fitting for the life that she now is destined to live. But instead of going out and finding clothes for herself, it is her newly adopted father who gives her her clothes. This whole expression that I went at length to describe at the beginning of the message, put on, put on, put on. Maybe my favorite, aside from Colossians 3, my favorite of that is Romans 13. Put on what or who? The Lord Jesus Christ. You see, when it comes down to it, these aren't even necessarily new clothes. They're new to us. But do you realize that you are wearing Jesus' wardrobe? They're his clothes. They're not even just simply arbitrary clothes. They're his. They're from his closet. And God the Father puts them on, or he calls us to put on, excuse me. He says, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience bearing with one another and forgiving each other. Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. This is what God the Father says to you, and this is all He says to you. Get dressed. That's it. Get dressed. It isn't you going and shopping for your clothes. It is him providing it. And his simple command is this. And it is, it is only this. Get dressed. Put on these things. For this is the Lord Jesus. Just as he says in Romans 13, now as we do this, we are putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. Was Jesus compassionate? Was Jesus kind? Was the Lord Jesus humble, gentle, and patient? Did Jesus really bear with others? Oh my goodness, did Jesus forgive others? Did Jesus put on, was Jesus, didn't even have to put it on, Jesus, was he loving? These are his clothes. And we put him on. When you're sitting in a marital counseling setting and some of the worst hurts and they are no small issue and there is no attempt on my part this morning to provide some sort of escape 
for a husband or a wife who has wronged the other one as though that is meaningless. It is not. But are you able to say of yourself, just as the Lord forgave you? See, this is where the real challenge comes in, isn't it? We are, I've said this before, we are quick, relatively so, quick to say, Jesus died for my sins. How quick are you to say, Jesus died for your sins? Especially, in particular, when hurt has occurred, when conflict has been experienced. Jesus died for that. We say to those who have hurt us, we say either to ourselves, to someone else looking to garner weight against this individual. We tell fellow men of the wrongs of our wives. We tell fellow wives of the wrongs of our husbands. We tell friends of our mutual friend and how bad he or she hurt us. And again, at times quite legitimately painful. Some of the worst kinds of pain. But oftentimes when I'm sitting in those environments, the question that I will ask is, can you say, Jesus has forgiven that? You see, we want payment. We want payment. We want this to be paid for, and in our first and initial reaction, who is going to pay for it? The other person. What if Jesus stood in between that conflict and said to you, the offended one, I paid for that sin. Are you ready to release it to the cross as you are your own sin? Can you release to the cross, the failure of the dearest of friends who hurt you deeply, and be able to say, Jesus died for that. Again, going back to our study out of the gospel-centered life, much further near the end of the study, is a chapter on the subject of forgiveness. You can imagine how critical that chapter, that that concept is to the relationship between humans in, in earthly relation. Chapter 8 says this, When we say, I just can't forgive that person for what he did to me, we are essentially saying that person's sin is greater than mine. Our awareness of our own sin is very small while our awareness of another sin is very big. Our underlying feeling is that we deserve to be forgiven, but the person who offended us does not. We are living with a small view of God's holiness, a small view of our own sin, and a small view of the cross of Jesus. The descriptions that... Paul gives these various elements of our wardrobe, compassion, to show sensitivity to those who are in need. And I have to be honest with you that over the years I have found that I am not terribly compassionate in every situation. It's great news, because that's not what he's talking about. This is not your compassion. It's Jesus' compassion. Kindness. Kindness manifests itself in a sweet disposition and a thoughtful interpersonal dealing. Humility. It means having a realistic view of oneself. In Romans chapter 12, we're told to be sober-minded. It doesn't mean that we are worthless and it doesn't mean we are kings and queens. It means we have a good estimation of ourselves. I'm a sinner. I receive the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I'm called to extend it to you. Humility. Gentleness. It means not behaving harshly, arrogantly, or self-assertively, but with consideration for others. 
I don't know if I've ever presented this before, but gentleness has a misunderstood meaning. In the New Testament, another way to understand the word gentleness is this. It's a pictorial image of a powerful horse, but one that is under the control of his rider. That's gentle. It is not wimpy. It is not mushy. It is strength under the control of the rider. Whose control are we under? The Lord Jesus himself. Maybe I'm angry. Maybe I am distraught for good reason. I am desperate for my rider to restrain and to bring gentleness. Patience. It is in fact the quality of what follows after it. Long-suffering and self-restraining that we might bear with one another and forgive one another bearing with means putting up with others and enduring discomfort there is no doubt that forgiveness and bearing with are painful at times it means as I've already said I am transferring the responsibility of the payment of this wrong done I'm transferring it from my responsibility to Jesus Lord I can't I don't know how to forgive this I don't know this hurt is so deep and Jesus says I know I know it is and therefore only my blood can pay for it It means discomfort. It does. It comes with discomfort. And forgiving means not holding a grudge or a grievance, but letting it go, I've already said. In chapter 8 of the study material, Gospel Center Life, again, I just continue on with an additional comment. Forgiveness is costly. It means canceling a debt when we feel we have every right to demand payment. It means absorbing the pain the hurt, the shame, and the grief of someone's sin against us. It means longing for repentance and restoration. But this is exactly how God has acted toward us in Jesus Christ. And through the gospel, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do the same towards others. We go quickly to the stories of Scripture, Matthew 18. That comes up often. Why? Because we are all the time dealing with it. Of the two servants and the king. The king who forgave the great debt of the first servant. But the first servant not recognizing the debt that had been paid. Not realizing the gravity of what had been done for him. Cannot find it within himself to go and to forgive the very small debt of a brother. Of a fellow servant. And then lastly, love. Put on love which means the very best for another person. You probably know this, that in the original languages of the New Testament that there are three or maybe four words for the the word love in our English language. One is eros, it means romantic or erotic love. One is phileo, which means brotherly love, Philadelphia, the, the city of brotherly love. But the other is agape, unconditional divine love. And I tell you that in verse... 14, the love that is described is agape. If there's, any, if there's any assurance that what is being talked about, this wardrobe that we are to put on, there's any assurance that it is not ours, we didn't make it, we didn't buy it, it could be found in the, in the expression of love, for agape is only divinely given, unconditional. We exhibit it when we are united with Christ, and only then can we show agape. The third and final point of this passage is that we would submit and surrender to his call. Now that we are wearing this royal wardrobe, unstained, perfect in every sense, now that we are wearing the most beautiful clothes that were ever known, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, we are called to go and to do in that manner. Verse 15 to 17, verses, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, 
teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. little challenge for you. What is the key word in those three verses? You see it three times. Thanks. Thankfulness. Thanksgiving. I'm looking at my royal wardrobe. I know what is underneath, and now I know what is laid over top. Thankfulness is the only reasonable response. I know what's underneath. I know the scars. I know the bruises. I know the failures. And God has decided to cover all of that with the robe, the royal robe of his son. How can we not be thankful? How can it not set us? The peace of Christ, you are no longer an enemy of God, but his son or his daughter. You're at peace with God. There is nothing between you that is in turmoil. There are moments of discipline, without a doubt, but it is as of a father and a son, not an orphan or an enemy. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. Let the word of Christ richly dwell. Repeat and rehearse this truth. Let it dwell in your hearts, within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. If there is anyone I can imagine, Tony, I I feel for you, I imagine the singing that goes on in your house from your beautiful wife. (laughs) Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to Him, through Him, to God the Father. The 19th century theologian, at one point a bishop of Durham in England, he said this, Thanksgiving is the end of all human conduct whether observed in words or works. J.B. Lightfoot. Thanksgiving is the end of all human conduct. It's, It's the final expression of us being called a son or a daughter and wearing royal robes. There really is no other reasonable explanation and even in the midst of conflict and again not diminishing human rubs and 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 wrestling and 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 failures and missed expectations not minimizing some are very difficult to overcome is anything too great for our father is any restoration too great for him To say to a hurting wife, a hurting husband, to say to one or the other, really both, is there anything for which you can give thanks today? This pain, this hurt, do you believe that your God, that your Father is big enough to turn that into a, to turn that into a moment of shaping you into the Lord Jesus Christ? And thankful that he has chosen to do such things through you. I close simply with this idea, and it's important. Why is this such an important subject under the category of disciple-making? Following, leading and following, a culture of leading and following. I want you to know that Colossians 3, 12 to 17, what we have just looked at, extended our time on, what we have looked at is for fellow disciples and disciple makers i say it this way while the put on of this passage and the subsequent conduct of colossians 3 12 to 17 can and should be directed towards those far from christ do i believe that this should mo- we should model this in every environment of course that we would show kindness and compassion humility gentleness bearing with one another forgiving one another, 
and loving others. Do I believe that this is meant in, in a larger sense, that we can apply this to our relationships that are not centered around Christ? Of course, I believe that. But this specific application is for fellow disciples. Paul is speaking to an audience of disciples and disciple makers who share in one body. Disciples are marked by these things among one another. You might be imagining that what we're talking about is, I'm encouraging you, or Paul is encouraging us to go out and to share the good news of Jesus Christ and to love those outside of him, those apart from him, that they might come to know the Lord Jesus. While that is all well and good and appropriate in its own right, it is not what Paul is talking about. He's saying that as you look across the room right now, or maybe next to you sitting where you sit right now, he is saying to you these things. This is for fellow disciples. As soon as you start leading and following, I can promise you that there will be conflict, disappointment, mixed expectations. You see, we hear it a lot that those who are on the outside of us, those who are looking in, would they want to see this directed towards them? Of course. But here's what we oftentimes hear, and I'm sure you've heard it. Why on earth would I want to exchange the warring, the turmoil, the despisement, the brokenness of this world to walk into your fellowship and experience the exact same thing? Why would I do that? You are the biggest repellent to me when disciples do not treat one another as Paul is calling us. And this is his simple command to us in this room and the larger community of faith that is outside this room, but our believers, he is saying to us, get dressed. That's it. Get dressed. And if you're wearing royal robes, it will look like this. A husband to a wife, wife to a husband. It will look like this. And I know hardship. I know hardship. I know for me it is not easy. And in my flesh, I resist every one of these garments. But the Lord Jesus did not resist them. And so as I belong to him, as I belong to my heavenly father, he hands me my new wardrobe. And he says no longer. And if you want to reach someone on the outside... And well-intentioned as that is, you cannot ask them to leave the turmoil of one and exchange it for the perceived turmoil of the other. They don't want it. No thank you. That's why I can't stand public displays of brothers and sisters fighting with each other. It has no business. Clearly, we are not living chapter 3, 12 to 17 in those moments. Is there time for admonishment? He says it. Is there time for correction and rebuke? Absolutely. Every bit of it done in love, every bit of it done believing, hey, the Lord Jesus has forgiven that. I don't hold that against you. Now let me help resolve whatever it is that is hurting inside and causing that to be the case. Tony and Sarah, if you would come up. There is just no getting This is such an important passage for our church today. For every fellowship of believers. So I simply read again. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord has for. Lord forgave you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Would you pray with me? Father God, I need this, we need this. Disciple making cannot happen until we surrender to these truths. And we know that the Lord Jesus, number one, he gave all of himself, nothing withheld. He bought us, he, had, he provided the adoption 
that would be required that we might become sons and daughters. And we turn around and we sling mud at our brothers and sisters. May it never be. Pray that you would correct this in us gently as you always do. Pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.